It really is my honor to introduce Charles von Gutten. Charles is a palliative care physician who was one of the founding forces of palliative care in the US. And I had the honor to get to know him early in the coalition's work. And um, with some work we were doing, you know, it was the CHIPS program for those who go back to inpatient um, hospital palliative care. And we got this itty bitty little grant that barely paid for anything. And um, I was working with uh, Steve Panella and Mike Rabo, and they said, well, let's, let's see if Charles Von Gutten and Frank Ferris want to join us. And we sit at, down at Sandy, when they were down at San Diego Hospice, and we had nothing to pay them. And they, they participated fully and really, I think, shaped a lot of the thinking. Um, you know, Charles started the, what was EPIC, the Education for Palliative Care Physicians. Um, really shaped the inpatient palliative care movement, Mo has now moved into um, a new location working in Cleveland, Ohio, and bringing the movement to the next level. I, one of the things I really ad appreciate when I talk to Charles is this ability to see kind of where's the glide path, because I think we spend a lot of time this is hard work, and not everybody gets it. So sometimes it can feel like it is an uphill battle because we're, we're bringing in and giving birth to the new healthcare system. And uh, Charles is somebody who's been there and done it and found the easy way to work with the patients, with the doctors, with the system. You know, every time I see a video of him, I'm just like, that's exactly the phrasing that we want all of us to be using. So please join me in thanking Charles for joining us today. All right, I'm very grateful. Judy, thank you for inviting me to be part of this conference. I, it's fun to be back in California. Many of you know I worked in San Diego for 13 years before moving to where I am now. So on that, on that note of where are we going, what's the future, if you just notice on my title slide, if you look down there under my name, it has the title Vice President Medical Affairs, Hospice and Palliative Care. All right, did you ever think you'd see that on a slide? Something that, that I mean, that's corporate. That is heavy duty corporate. <laughs> I'm dressed heavy duty corporate. But that's, I think, the tip off of the people, certainly where I'm working now, and the people I talk with as, as healthcare reform continues across the US. And one surgeon says, Charles, you're in the sweet spot. <laughs> All right, for those of us, I've been doing this now 26 years. It didn't feel like the sweet spot all the way along. It felt like pushing through a snowdrift or something. And so I think we are in a developmental time of change but the main message I want to give you is that, that things are moving um, in standard healthcare. So let's start with a case. This is Frank. He's at a meeting not unlike this. He's here with his son. And he's 58, and he developed a fever and a cough. And it was bad enough that he went to the emergency department, and they had found he had pneumonia. And it was bad enough that he was admitted to the hospital. And when the pneumonia didn't clear, he had a CT of the chest. And what you can see on the right side here, there's a, a sort of a raggedy mass here. If this is the heart, and those are the ribs, and the black areas are the lungs, that mass doesn't belong there. And he had a bone scan because he had aches and pains. Don't you love it when you see scans that have the arrows on there? <laughs> so those black spots don't belong there. And you notice those asymmetrical spots on his ribs. So this guy who was thought he was otherwise ordinary now has metastatic lung cancer. The sputum came back positive. There was no need for a biopsy. Does Frank need palliative care now at diagnosis? Yes. The, 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 um, the research of the last 10 years is really clear. 
the, the needs of pain, symptoms, family, social issues, financial issues, spiritual issues are all acute at this time. There's no one that disagrees that, that, that data is clear and that we need to move forward from diagnosis. But do we, we know how the story will end, right? Do we ever cure lung cancer? Never, ever, ever. Many people live a long time. And they live longer, and while they're living, they feel good, and they may feel like they're cured, but it always comes back. So we know where the story will end eventually. And this is from Joan Tino's study, which I think is the most important study related to our work in, in healthcare and health systems. And this was her um, data that she uh, published in JAMA in 2004, it was a look back study of all people in the US who had died. This was a representative sample of all people who died and where they died. And, they, and she and her colleagues asked them about the quality of that experience. Now this is the family members saying that the patient got excellent quality of care. Now this isn't excellent palliative care, this is overall excellent quality of care by whether the person died in a home health agency, so not hospice, home health agency, a home hospice program, a nursing home, or in the hospital, and that is where Americans die. Now what do you notice about this data? Say, I, so hospice rocks, <laughs> hospice rocks. Now when I was doing my PhD work, um, one of my advisors said, Charles, always study something where you don't need statistics to tell the difference. All right, so the hospice box is nearly twice as good as the others. All right, it's not subtle. This is not a little percentage. It's twice as good as the others. And this is a representative sample. So we can say, and I do say, hospice care has been proven to be the best end of life care for people who are expected to die. Now, that, I think that has enormous implications for everything else we do because it moves us out of the choice land or preference land to this is best care. You can either accept or reject advice about best care, but it's no longer oh, an option like whether you like red shoes or black shoes. This is also from that study drilling down a little more into the data for what, what um, what was behind that overall excellent care here. So um, for the, in the blue bar, the pa patient wanted more pain relief. Well, what strikes you about that? Well, it doesn't look like you really want to be in a um, uh, home health agency, does it? What about wanted physician contact? That should strike you as really odd. Because here, or anywhere in California, if somebody said, oh my god, quick, quick, I've got to get to a doctor, every telephone line says, call 911, go to the nearest hospital, right? So how could it be that dying patients in hospitals, 50% of them, this is not subtle, wanted more physician contact in a place that is crawling with doctors? And if you notice in the hospice box there, and home hospice is not a place where there are many physicians, there wasn't that desire. So pain was better, the sense of having your medical needs met, uh, and respect, having respect as a person. Where do you not want to be based on these data? The nursing home doesn't look so good, does it? Now I heard the comment out there about it, the data is old. There's one of the, um, features, I think, of, of research um, is not whether it's true or not, it's whether it's new. This study will never be done again. Too expensive, enormously uh, challenging to do. But I, it is, this is true. This is bedrock, I think. And everything that we do going forward is with the confidence that this has been proven. We don't need repeat studies to see if something else has changed. This is true. And the other thing that is true about hospice care as it's um, done in the US 
This is from a very influential health affairs article looking at, well, what's the cost savings of hospice care? And it's extraordinary. These are in um, $2012. $6,000 saved if somebody's in the hospice for a month. And what is that? It's simply avoiding hospitalization. Because hospice care is expensive as it is, but it's a lot less expensive than be someone being in the hospital, which is what has happened if you don't have a home-based approach in the last months of life. So better quality saves money. Anybody heard that about the national health care movement? Where things are going in hospitals and health care? Those are the two things that need to be achieved. So if that's the basis, all right, let me introduce you to another case. This is Pepe. She moved to Columbus, Ohio, which is where I'm working now, from New York City. She was diagnosed with breast cancer. Stage four, it spread to her bones, liver, lungs. Her primary care doc asked uh, palliative medicine to see her to help with pain. And the medical oncologist said, oh, sure, Charles, go see her. I was originally diagnosed with stage four metastatic breast cancer. From the get-go, do not pass go, do not collect $200, just go to the top of the class. And I thought it was a death sentence, and I took very, very, very aggressive chemo that practically killed me, but I was getting over it. Anyway, I get a call from Cindy saying that you would like to come and see me. And I'm thinking, a doctor that makes house calls? This is very interesting, but I was sort of skeptical, because then I figured, oh, God, I'm in worse condition than I thought. You know, I knew I was bad, but I didn't know I was that bad. And when I first met you, I remember the first thing I said to you, do not mention two words to me. Do not mention palliative care and do not mention hospice. So what do you notice about Pepe? Pepe is Pepe, and that is her real given name. She's well informed. She's a very smart, she's a New Yorker. She is very smart. She does her investigation. Does she, does she have any illusions about what she has? No, she knows she has advanced cancer. Does she think she can be cured? No. So why does she not want the use of the hospice and palliative care word? She knows it means death, and she is scared to death. Absolutely frightened. Well, of course, it's not true for anybody in this room, but why do you think they got me to see her? In Columbus, she scares people. <laughs> she, for one, she's from New York. So what do you know about New Yorkers? Uh, see, you all know, strong personalities. Yeah, so when you talk to Pepe, it's like she's coming right at you. And how well do you think that sits in good Midwestern Columbus, <laughs> where we're all polite? Yeah. So what should the response be? Because this is, the, all right, if, if this is the best, if um, palliative care is the best way to take care of people um, with um, cancer from diagnosis to death, she was just diagnosed months before this, well, what do you do when the patients say, don't you, you get away? I'm the feel-good doctor. Yeah, I, uh, I, I use a version of that. So the, the point is that you're not um, dissuaded by that. My answer to Pepe in her home was, fine, I promise not to use those words. What can I do for you? And off we went. So we'll come back to Pepe later. But I think th the point I want to make with this, it's no longer about the people who are open and want to choose palliative care or are open to hospice care. It's now, this is best care. How do we meet the more challenging patients that now, because we know this is best care, it's our obligation to get to them? So to me, that's part of this new world, this future. It's not just about the patients that are easy for us or that we're comfortable or who like us or want us. It's about getting people the care they need. And Pepe, she's terrified. She needs help with this. Now, some of you will know I, I did put the um, palliative care program together at UCSD's NCI Designated Cancer Center. Any, th this was their new building shortly after they had built it. Any guesses on, on what they want to connote to the 
to the community about what happens in a cancer center? Is it a lovely, warm, comfy place with the fireplace burning? And no. It's cold steel. This is, we, and UCSD is very clear. They will, they will cure cancer in the laboratory. You want to go to a place that is science-based and laboratory-based. And yet, they said, or they said to me, Charles, we want a palliative care program. And it had nothing to do with anything we've been talking about. The CEO at the time said, Charles, we have a 50% turnover rate in medical oncologists, meaning half of the medical oncologists are leaving every year. And they've been saying they need palliative care, and they've been saying they need palliative care, so give them palliative care. The culture in this place, there are two kinds of oncologists. There are the oncologists who take care of patients, and then there are the smart ones <laughs> who spend 80% of their time in the laboratory. Does that give you a sense of the, the culture? Yeah. And so they were all taking care of patients like Pepe, because who comes to a, an academic medical center? The people that say, uh, oh, I, you know, I just want to be comfortable. No, they're the people like Pepe. So this was the, uh, uh, the initial palliative care service. Uh, on the left there is the uh, nurse practitioner and the secretary who took calls and the psychologist and the pharmacist and the social worker and a somewhat middle-aged oncologist palliateur. But it, you notice it says the Doris Howell service. Well, why the Doris Howell service? Well, I said that this was a, a place where um, people who were told in the community they needed palliative care, they came running to the university because, no, no, not the palliative care. So I wanted to name it for this person, Doris Howell. Doris Howell was a pediatric hematologist oncologist. You can tell by her um, white hair and her stance. She's been in this longer than me. She's at Duke, Harvard, um, uh, Penn. She'd been working on pediatric palliative care, as so many of you are, from the 60s. Do you think she was successful? No. And yet, on campus, if you said her name anywhere, anywhere in the medical center, people said, oh, I love that woman. I love that woman. Well, what do you think I wanted in my new service in the cancer center? I wanted it associated with somebody that everybody loved. Now, everybody knew this was the Doris Howell Palliative Care Service. But being the Howell Service, I went to every oncologist in the um, cancer center, and I said, I know that you know that palliative care starts at diagnosis, it's, it's woven together from the beginning, um, and that hospice care is the completion of good care. But there are patients that come here that, um, you know, they're really scared of those words, and it's off-putting. And you know, there's some other oncologists here too, who this makes them really uneasy. So I want to call it the Howell Service, because it's much easier to say to a patient, I'm going to get the Howell Service involved. And it's easier on the patient, and it's easier on than us. Every one of the oncologists, to a person, Charles, oh, a, oh, absolutely, I get it, yes, oh, yeah, yeah, palliative care from, absolutely. And, and I know what you mean about those other oncologists. <laughs> so this is the data from the first six months. 26-bed inpatient oncology unit, that's all they had, that's where it was. The oncologists are across the bottom, and the number of patients they referred is along the left. Now, what do you make of this data? It varies. Now, speculate with me. Why does it vary? So I hear doctors fear death. Who's on service? Rotation. So that's true. This is rotating. People are on service for two weeks. Yeah. Doctors don't want to have the conversation, okay? And palliative care teams are quite willing to have the conversation if an oncologist asks. But this suggests that when you said there's so much variation, so when people look at this, usually they, sometimes they, um, they notice there's a super user here. So tell me who you think this doctor is. 
Tell me about this oncology. So I'm hearing younger, personal experience with palliative care, uh, understands its importance, highly trained in, in having skills, so primary palliative care skills for the oncologist, more comfortable with these conversations and these things. You know, uh, there are doc that's Dr. E. Dr. E has no need for the palliative care service, mostly. He's, he went into oncology because he likes this. He's got good skills. He only needs help when he has that, uh, and that it's a clinical syndrome that you all know about, the family from hell. <laughs> or if somebody has a really difficult symptom complex, but he's very good at all of it. He rarely needs us. Dr. A is the busiest oncologist. She, she is what you would call tough. She knows what needs to get done. She knows um, what she needs to, uh, to be working on. Um, she's not about to do the palliative care, but she knows who will. Her patients need it. It's not going to be her. The reason I put this up here, it is so important because it is exactly opposite of some of the energy that drives those of us in palliative care. You make those oncologists behave. You make them talk. All right. How? Those of you who have children, how easy is it to change other people? <laughs> All right, we don't change people. The, the model has to be we work together with them. So it, it doesn't bother me at all that some people refer essentially all their patients and some don't. Some of the ones on here are, um, uh, they're only on service two weeks a year. Um, but what about this? This is a moderate to high use group over here. These are the bone marrow transplant doctors. This is all of the bone marrow transplant doctors. Now, when you think of bone marrow transplant and you're thinking about what are those doctors like, what comes to mind? Are they warm and loving and kind? Spend lots of time with their patients? Really good? Their emotional intelligence is off the chart. Did you all hear that? Not. Yeah. They are highly technical. They, they would say, and this is what they did say, our job is to bring people this close to death and then rescue them. No bone marrow transplant is ever done for palliation. It is done for cure. It is harrowing. It's difficult. It's highly symptomatic. And they're all moderate to high users. In fact, a third of the patients in the first six months came from bone marrow transplant. Now, for most people, this is like, what, what kind of spell did you cast on them, Charles? <laughs> Wasn't a spell, but it relates to this relationship of it's not about being critical. It's about how do you compliment? You don't have to have the conversation. You don't have to have the symptom control stuff. We will work together with you without shaming, blaming. Together, we provide comprehensive, NCI designated referral level co oncology care in San Diego. For those of you who've been in this a while, do you catch the difference with the way many people have, have worked in our field and kind of enjoy being the counterculture? This data was, um, came out of Dana-Farber, which I think is fascinating. And I think it is, although I haven't seen it in any other subspecialty, I think it is likely transferable. So there are two different kinds of oncologists. And I am an oncologist. Uh, this is why I can talk about them in this way. <laughs> the type 1 oncologist likes both the biomedical and the psychosocial. They have clear communication strategies, and they enjoy the positive impact they have on patients and families, no matter what the outcome. That was Dr. E. But there's a type 2 oncologist who is biomedical only, has relatively distant patient and family relationships, and has a strong sense of failure and a very poorly developed ability to communicate, particularly um, when things are not going well. Well, think about if you're um, a palliative care professional wanting to engage. Will the same strategy of engagement work with these two different types of oncologists? The word, and this is where I see tr trouble happens all the time. The, um, 
there's a type 1 oncologist who is deeply engaged in his or her patient care, um, wants some help, but is in control and feels like they got this. And if palliative care moves in and does it for them and doesn't give them any information and just uh, takes over, guess what the reaction is? Don't let palliative care ever see my patient again. I never want them to see my patient because there was no respect for the doc. But the type 2 oncologist, if you sort of expect them to do it, they too will say, don't ever have palliative care come back because they want palliative care to do it all. So diametrically opposed clinical approaches to the doctor in order to get the patients the care they need. I think that is enormously important. So I left San Diego five years ago to go to Ohio Health, which is a, a system that you will never have heard of. It's a typical American health system, which is why I went. Now, you wouldn't know that from reading their literature, because what does is, what is, what is the marketing of, of health care tend to look like these days? Every place is God's gift. They're the best in everything. There are so many awards. It's like going to fifth grade, you know, and everybody's got an award down there. <laughs> but they are typical. They're a nonprofit um, health system serving their part of the world, trying to do a good job. And, the, of course, the thing that caught my eye when they were recruiting me was this. 447 days cash on hand. Now, are there any business people in the room? What does it do to you to hear 447 days cash on hand? You just get a warm glow all over, don't, don't you? Yeah, when I was working at San Diego Hospice, we usually had six days of cash on hand. <laughs> Big difference. Now, of course, when I went, I was thinking, oh, my God, they're rich as Croesus. <laughs> They'll pay for anything I want them to do. And then I got there, and I learned why they have that much money <laughs> in the bank. My image is a little, those, remember those little snap purses that your grandmother had? To, firmly shut on her lap. <laughs> yeah, their favorite word is discipline. Disciplined planning, disciplined execution, disciplined budgeting, discipline, discipline, discipline. Just to give you the flavor. And some of you uh, on the, uh, West Coast are uh, vaguely aware of, uh, of Ohio. Um, <laughs> Lake Erie is to the north, Kentucky is to the south, and all that smear there in the middle, that's the, that's the footprint of Ohio Health. So it stays away from Cleveland and Cincinnati, but sort of has a very rural population. Eleven hospitals they own, four hospitals that they're sort of gating. Um, but it's big. It's big. And the CEO recruited me saying, Charles, this, you know, healthcare is changing. We are going into a, we have been in a volume based world and we get paid for everything we do and we're good at it. But going forward in a value based world, if we don't have hospice and palliative care well developed, we will fail. Will you please put that together for us? I thought, oh, sure. No, that's not true. I, every time I look at this, I get, I get chest pressure. <laughs> it radiates down my right arm a little bit, but it's a huge responsibility. And yet, that's the vision for the future. From the leading, and you hear that all over the country, those leading healthcare get why we are not just nice to have, essential to success. If they don't have it, they will fail. So this journey from volume to value the predominant payment f in the U.S. is still fee-for-service, and it is in California, too. Because California so much discount fee-for-service is why it's so um, sort of onerous, particularly in Southern California. 30% of Medicare spending in the last year of life. Ohio is a high-intensity, high-volume, high-expense state in the last two years of life. And the CEO said we need a system, uh, a coordinated system. And they're behind. There are other... The, uh, the, uh, Ohio State University, who is in town, Mount Carmel, many of you know of because they've been a palliative care leadership center for now 15 years. They are really behind. They, they, they didn't adopt when nobody, nobody would call Ohio Health an early adopter. They're very conservative. 
But these are the facts that I laid out for them, that I laid out for you. Hospice care is proven to be the best care at the end of life. So the issue for us as a system, the issue for the US as a system, the issue for you as you are trying to drive change, is we need to reach all eligible patients. Not the ones that just find us, not the ones that like the name, but the peppies of the world who say, don't you dare use those words. It improves quality and lowers cost. It's been proven to do that, and that's what you have to do to survive as a health system. And we need to treat it then as a quality measure, not as a choice like the color of shoes, but death with hospice care is a quality outcome measure that if it doesn't happen, we should be asking why, in the same way we ask, why, do, why didn't everyone get their flu shot this year? Why were there so many falls on 7 and yellow? Why um, uh, do we not have vaccination rates in our children? It's a, I would strongly advocate this is now a quality measure. It's not just an aspirational add-on. Palliative care similarly has been shown to improve quality and reduce cost. It was, ex it was shown to work in hospices and now you get it out there to everyone else who needs it and lo and behold it has the same effect. And having one program with one leadership and one standard of care is going to improve quality while reducing cost. This is the mantra in American healthcare right now, reducing variation. So what does it look like? Yes, there are the hospitals. This is Ohio Health Home Care, a single corporate entity. Um, Connie, uh, who is the president, like, likes thinking of it a house, so, so we make it look like a house. Um, more than 10,000 patients, so more than anybody that's in all of our hospitals combined are being taken care of at home. And you notice there's a home health agency, the hospice agency, we put palliative care here, there's an employed medical group um, that supports those, but it's also home medical equipment, um, infusion pharmacy, um, orthotics, uh, sort of the rest of the, the rest of the picture all in one place. That's strength, to have everything in one place that's, that serves the entire system. And that's those are the counties. Now, for those of you who are nurses, you know what it's like to have to cover 21 counties? This gives me a chest pain, too. It's, it's one thing to talk about the cities, but rural care, you, you see it here in California, it's not like the cities, right? The people are not, they are different. You need to meet them where they are. And this is the vision that we will have consult services in the hospital, specialty inpatient units. For us, that's Kobacker House home palliative care, home hospice. Those services will be available in the extended care facilities. And of course, ambulatory outpatient palliative care. A whole integrated system of hospice and palliative care for this independent, typical health system. Now for some people, this looks very breathtakingly large. But I think that's where the future is. Because all of this needs to work together if we're going to take care of people like Pepe. This is Kobacker House, 32 DIP beds for those of you who speak hospice Medicare language. Um, now, wh what do you notice about this photograph? Beautiful. Oh, beautiful. And people come up there and it's like, oh, it's like, it's like a hotel in the woods. You know, a little lodge and inside it's, it, it's, it's very arts and crafts. But there's a real downside to having a pretty building which is, well, that's where all the palliative care is. That's where all the hospice is. If you want comfort, you better go there. So those of you who are all wishing for one of these, be careful what you wish for. But it is our dedicated inpatient unit um, with dedicated staff where we can do high-tech symptom control that we can't do anywhere else in the system. Now, to just give you a flavor of this, it was designed not to be a teaching facility, and yet, having the medical students and residents and our fellows in there is critically important. So this is, this is a, um, a whiteboard in the room where um, the docs uh, tend to congregate. And because you can't read it, it's called the highs and lows board. So I transcribed it here. So you get some of the, it's tobacco pack years, 228. Does that strike you as high? Or the one next to it? A patient started smoking at age six. How much alcohol do you drink? Two cases of beer per day. 
So as your eye goes over this, do you get a sense of, oh my God, this is the most extreme um, medicine that you're ever going to see. This is the way hospitals used to be. You saw the most extreme. That's why people, um, all of us docs trained in hospitals like that, because you got to see the extremes. It's a wonderful teaching environment. And it also does something for the, the, the spirit of everybody who's there for, can, can you believe this? Have you ever seen anything this, this low? Look down there at the bottom right-hand corner. Platelets, one. <laughs> the point is that there's tremendous intellectual fervor around this, because taking care of this kind of population is tough. This is what the, the corporate folks um, see. The, most of you have seen the the bisected rectangle with um, standard care on the left and then comfy care on the right. Nick Christakis calls this the over-the-wall model. You pitch the patient over the wall <laughs> from uh, standard treatment to comfort care. And every, everybody at the um, uh, administrative level and down got it that that's where we were. That was our mental model of comfort care. You're either treat or comfy, as opposed to moving to the bisected um, rectangle where palliative care starts a diagnosis and hospice care becomes the completion of good care when the time comes. And on the right is listed all the, all the benefits to the health system for doing this. So this was part of the Sanders sales speech. And the other thing, by having it in one program with one leader, and all the presidents agreed, you can only get your palliative care from one place. You cannot start it up on your own. I had a couple of them try, but I sicked my president on them. She's like an ICBM. I launch her. Out she goes. And she is very, all of you nurse leaders know how effective a nurse president can be, right? She only gets her answer. So, but palliative care is defined as a team. Docs, nurse practitioners, social worker, chaplain, pharmacist. No, 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 we won't, no, it's not on to say, oh, we'll just have a social worker and a nurse practitioner. Mm -mm -mm. Palliative care, this is how it's defined. It's not up to you to define it. It's up to you to decide how much you want of it in your hospital. So let me take you to a patient I want to spend a little time with because in many ways he represents the, the challenges of this new world if we are going to make sure that this is for everyone. Kevin had neuroendocrine cancer of the pancreas. He's been divorcing for four years, and it is a vicious divorce. He's lived in Naples, Florida. He got his cancer care at Moffitt Cancer Center, which is also one of the nation's top specialty cancer hospitals. Um, this is, I'm showing you video clips from an interview um, after he was, had been enrolled in hospice care for four months. He moved to Columbus to be near his wife and kids. This is the one he's been divorcing. He's living with his mother-in-law. <laughs> and I'm going to take that belly laugh as, oh, you can just imagine what this is like. He's been hospitalized at Kobacher House for a hyperactive delirium, a wild, thrashing hyperactive delirium. And I'm interviewing him in front of 50 physicians who had come from around the world as part of a leadership training course. And this was the... the, the the purpose of this was, how do you use a patient to make your points rather than you make them yourself? It's a very old system in medicine um, or practice where a doctor interviews a patient in public and the patient does the teaching. So I'm, uh, I'm going to ask you at the end of this then, what do you notice about this patient? How, he, how does he describe the role of the hospice and palliative care physician when he first uh, encountered him? I want you to compare and contrast his understanding of hospice care with, with what happened, and what about the relationship with his wife? So you got, you feel like you got state-of-the-art, best possible cancer care at one of the best cancer hospitals really in the world. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and especially for this form. For this form of a rare cancer that sort of sneaks up on you. Correct. Yeah. So how do you see yourself now? You've had the best of care. Mm -hmm. You're back here in Columbus. You've been hospitalized here at Kobacher House. How do you see things now? Well, what happened was I was, um, through a friend of mine, put in touch with the director of 
I think he would probably be in his position in Naples. Mm -hmm. What? At a bow. At a bow mm -hmm. It was called down there. And um, what a great godsend for me. I was in uh, not so good. Mm -hmm. He took the bulls by the horns and got things done. So took the bulls. So this, the palliative care group there in Naples took the bull by the horns. You were in a pretty bad place. And what happened? Well, he sat me down and discussed with me through a friend's introduction what hospice is. Uh -huh. I didn't know what it was. This, uh -huh. this is what I knew about hospice. You had to be near the end, and you know you have to abide by what, at the time, I considered stringent rules to fit into their plan, mm -hmm. into their facility. And guess what? I didn't think it was for me. You didn't fit. <laughs> no way. I just two weeks before that, I was working. I'm living on my own, mm -hmm. driving. And this is, to give you a time frame, this is um, end of July, end of July. And so the more I spoke to him and the more I saw that there was, for whatever reason, in my case, some give and take, you know, that he said, oh, that's not true. You don't have to this, or that's not always true. Um, because I didn't know about, I mean, they broke it down for me pretty good. And um, I think they said at one point, two months. You know, you have to be within under two or three months. It doesn't mean you're going to die within two or three months, but that has to be kind of the, you know, where you're headed. Yeah. And... Really, is the first time I heard a number that had been that sort of that concrete about yeah. a short time. And I never asked, so I can't say that it wasn't because I didn't. Um, nobody ever told me, or they were keeping it from me. Maybe part of my family may have been, but I never asked. I just thought I could beat this. So what was the role of the hospice and palliative medicine physician? Was it just education? Does the compassion, but does the phrase took the bull by the horns have any meaning? I don't think we usually associate that with anybody in our field. We are, we are all very polite and we're, we're gentle and persuasive, but this is what you need. This is a med, yeah, led him, said, the best medical care for you is this. And what about the, um, his understanding of hospice care? Was he misinformed or had he encountered or been told by, um, nobody in this room falls in this category, of course, but those hospices who we can call rigid, who they have a little Procrustean bed that you must fit, and if you don't fit that little bed, um, sorry, you're not ready. You're, or the, the word I loathe, you're not appropriate. <laughs> right. So there, was, there had to be an engagement with that. There was the, the, the barrier in his mind, because what, what was his mental image of himself? It's, it's getting better. He was working two weeks ago. How bad could it be, Doc? I'm going to beat this. How many cancer patients say that? I'm going to beat this. Yeah, that, and do we cure neuroendocrine cancer of the pancreas? Ever, 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 ever? No. So the beat this, that's all coping. That's not reality. Now that may be the way he thinks about it, but, but in, this, in this future world, these are the patients we need to be really good at. Um, we can't just say, oh, sorry, when you're ready for palliative care, I'll come talk to you. He needs it. He needs to be rescued, this is best care, like the person says, I really don't need antibiotics, and they're septic. All right. 
So we have that model. It, that needs to move to this. This is the best care. It's going to be hard for you not to um, accept best medical care because we feel that strongly that it's the best for you. What did you notice? He was sitting next to his wife. What's the relationship with his wife? I'm asking you to read body language. Well, isn't that amazing? People who knew them, when they saw that, it's like, what? They weren't clawing and scratching at each other and, and the usual contested divorce. Illness changes everybody. Now I want you to watch for what's most valuable to him about being enrolled in hospice care. You know, this, this care is so phenomenal. I have such a good, I feel so strong about how I have weekly nurse care. They come out to the house. I'm actually staying with my mother-in-law because she's home all the time and she can give me my medications and more so make sure I eat. So I'm actually putting on weight, so that's been a good thing. Yeah. That makes mother-in-law's happy. <laughs> yeah. So she's the perfect person for that. Um, and so, um, and they have the 24 hours where at any time I call and within 15 minutes, like clockwork, they're calling me back and what's the problem? You know, okay, this is what we need you to do. Take this, do this, take that, or whatever it may be, and call me back in an hour. And that feels like a godsend. That's, I mean, it's such a, um, it's a relief. It's another person or people, a whole group of people being there. So you like that idea of somebody being there? You Absol call them. Absolutely. That gives you a sense of comfort? Absolutely. Uh -huh. You know, without that, I mean, that just makes such a big deal. And I know, I mean, my mother-in-law is 77 years old. And I know she gets concerned, as well as I, that, you know, are we putting too much on her plate? Are we asking her to do too much? So you're worried about being a burden on her. Correct. Yeah. But knowing that this source, resource, mm -hmm. is there mm -hmm. um, puts her at ease as well. So you're making it sound like without this system, you, don't, you wouldn't be able to cope with your current situation. No, I, I, it gives me the strength to do it mm -hmm. and the ability to know that if it's 2 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday night mm -hmm. <laughs> that I don't have to worry about not getting a hold of somebody or getting a question answered. Maybe silly, you know, for me. Nobody's ever told me that. Obviously, they tell you the direct opposite. But, you know, I know my mother-in-law, as it's gotten more and more into this, because I've been at her home first first week in August. Um, and so as time's gone on and maybe some of the conditions, maybe certain days I wasn't doing so well, I'm sure she gets a little scared and uptight. Not only that, she also takes care of my father-in-law who has um, who has a uh, short-term memory loss. You Anybody getting wider and wider eyes? Oh my God. Yeah, this is pretty shaky stuff, right? It's just, it, it sort of, it feels like it's just hanging there. Um, any one of them could make it fall apart. And yet, rather than, but he needs it. It will go better if he, if he gets it. But so who had to change in order to be able to take care of this kind of patient and family? The hospice. This is the kind of patient that hospices used to never take care of, uh, wouldn't want to take care of. Um, what was most valuable to him? The contact. Help is, help is a phone call away. It wasn't the lovely doctor who was who, who's doing fabulous. This man was, was crazed, hyperactive delirium a day ago. He had bad pain. Does that matter to him now that it's resolved? No, the real important stuff is the family stuff, the people stuff, the, the, the really practical support. Uh, it's, not the, it's not the drugs at all, which I think is, is such an important take home. And that's the reason he can be at home, out of the hospital, at, at overall best cost and best quality, because the, it's the practical stuff. 
uh, even and, and the willingness to engage with um, a 77-year-old mother-in-law who's on the side of the divorcing daughter with a demented man at home and still has her son-in-law at home, and he goes bonkers every once in a while. Isn't that amazing? Those are the people that need to get medals. What about this patient would drive the hospice, not you, of course, but the hospice staff in Ohio crazy? You know, I stopped believing the doctors. I almost put myself in a position where, okay, they say this, but I feel this way, and I'm going with this. Well, that's what I was thinking. You said down in Naples, they were saying, well, probably two months, but no one can ever really know. But that was four months ago, five months ago? July. July, so July, August, September, October, four months ago. And there are days when you feel like a million bucks. So you think, yeah. well, what do they know? One of the things that strikes me is the last 25 years of research have given us powerful tools. Our ability to relieve symptoms and control the suffering of advanced disease has never been more powerful in the history of human medicine than it is right now. And that's brought to bear on this patient, but, but the consequence, the, you know, the consequence I would like is I want him to kiss my hands and say, oh, thank you, doctor. <laughs> no, what do you get? Well, I've, well because the doctor said, he's in a hospice program, he was told he had two months to live, that was four months ago. He feels terrific today, no symptoms, no shortness of breath, his thinking is clear, and he feels like he's going to live forever. So what are the, I, I, you heard it, I stopped believing the doctors. How normal do you think that is? Of course it's normal. What effect do you think that had on the hospice? He, he was talking about, well, I, I feel so good. He's gained weight. He, you know, can I, can I um, get more chemotherapy? So I heard, discharge him. <laughs> Quick. <laughs> yeah. His prognosis has not changed. But this is how he feels. So who has to do the growing and changing to accommodate this patient? It's us. It is very different taking care of people who they, they live by emotion. If they feel good, the world's their, their oyster, and, and of course they want it all. And that's normal, and we need to be rooting for them. On the other hand, we also know his cancer. There is nothing that, that's available to try to make his cancer better. And um, if we gave it to him, we'd kill him because his performance status is so poor. But we have to be able to tolerate that language which means we have to know something about oncology. We have to know something about cardiology and pulmonology if, if we're going to get all of the patients that need us. He died one month after this video was done. As expected, at home, family intact. That's a win, but it's a win we could never have had 10 years ago, five years ago. It takes tremendous commitment to look forward because based on all the strength we have, how do we get this to everyone? That's its own new challenge. So how do we have to change? Because I think this is, um, I'm thinking about all the things I've ever read about what happens when you win a war. When we won um, World War II, when, um, even when uh, we lost in Vietnam, what had to change? It was different than when we were fighting the war. If we're going to get to all patients who need us, not the ones that are just convenient or easy who want us, we have to have a both and, not an either or way of thinking. Yes, we can take care of your symptoms and we can tolerate the, the, that you're hoping for something better. It's best medical care, it's not choice anymore. It's, it's whether or not you'll accept best medical care. We need to stop presenting it like shoes at Nordstrom's. Do you like this pair or this pair? It's best medical advice, now you either accept or reject the best medical advice. But we're not being clear, we're not giving any messages about, oh, things are all equivalent and you, you're welcome to go ahead and do therapy that we know won't work. Um, and it's very expensive, but just because it's your choice. We're moving into an, um, uh, a world where that is not gonna be economically supportable. But 
the, so that we can tolerate the ambivalence and wishing for something different. And do you think that applies to more than just patients and families? Of course it does. Friends, doctors, nurses. There are others. We are a complex um, being. But our field is so strong and has proven to be so much value, we can do this. And we can be confident in our skills. And that means confident in being able to uh, do transfusions or take care of people on ventilators or people on dormitamine or people who have had a ventricular assist device planted. The same skills work. They are just as grateful and the good outcomes happen. But we're the ones that then have to, to be willing, because they're just skills. It's all part of the success of winning the war, which really in many ways we have. Palliative care, hospice care has won in terms of its relationship to where healthcare is going. We can enjoy being an essential part of standard healthcare. I'm an example, and I'm not alone. We have a call once a month with uh, physicians who are in similar roles in similar systems. If you can imagine a call like that, we all whine together, because uh, it feels good to whine together. But the point is, we're moving into being just a standard part, but not the most important. We are as important as all the other. We're not special anymore. We're part of good standard healthcare, and that's something else. That, that it's up to us to move forward. Let me bring you back to Pepe. She's four years from the diagnosis. She had metastatic inflammatory breast cancer. The prognosis treated is six months. I think people have to be educated on really what is palliative care and that it doesn't mean that you're going to die tomorrow or you're gonna die next week and it doesn't mean hospice. It means the whole system of care. It means pain management. It means having somebody as wonderful as Charles coming to your house, you know, once a month and, and talking to you and giving you a lot of courage and a lot of moral support and listening to you, um, I hate to say bitch, but you know, com complain about things or, or tell them happy things. Can you believe this is coming out of her mouth? The woman that practically met me with a shotgun at the door. And now she's like this booster for palliative care. Well, wh how did that happen? It's because I wasn't, and my colleagues weren't, OK, you don't want to talk about it. That's fine. We don't have to use those words. We're going to take care of you. And once she learned what it was, now she wants the world to know, which is why she wanted to get videotaped. And she's very pleased to know that she's here in California with you. So the system, so we've got, we just started basically in 2015. We're now at 6,000 consults per year. Um, the hospice has doubled. We're now at 3,000 hospice deaths per year. That's 40% of our patients that are getting hospice care. Three years ago, it was 25%. The average length of stay is 60 days. The median length of stay moved from 10 to 15 days. That's enormous change. Now, people also often say to me, but Charles, there's a workforce shortage. And my response is, yes. Um, most, for all the significant things I've tried to do in my career, somebody always said, oh, Charles, that's impossible. Give it up. And you may have then ascertained that there's a certain quality of my personality. I like to persevere. And if somebody says to me it's impossible, <laughs> I just knuckle down. But I think this, this is also one of these things that we have to be careful what we're saying to ourselves. I hear an awful lot in our field, oh, there are just not enough. Well, somehow we'll have to manage. <laughs> and, and my point of view is, all right, we are a growing field. Uh, every field that grows quickly has a workforce shortage because you use up what's in the workforce pool. But that means then, um, uh, you know, particularly in a capitalist uh, society where you're competing for resources. All right, well, so our, our starting salary for our docs went up $70,000 to keep up with the competition. All right, that's, um, and we're reached that, we've reached that again, and, and I'm having that discussion again. So this is um, sort of where we were uh, when I started here uh, of the members of the team. If you look down this first, we had 12, 12 total working palliative care and what I would call the medical department of the hospice. 
that middle column, you notice we're at 75. So we've gone from 13 to 75 in about four years. Now, for many people would say, oh my God, that's a huge number. How did you get that many? Well, I've just told you the steps. And we're on track over the next five years to reach 135. Now, yes, I need to recruit the, the people I need, and yes, I'm, I'm working hard. Uh, it's hard to recruit in Ohio. Um, it was easier recruiting in San Diego, believe it or not. But I have full confidence we're going to get there. This is what we need. People say, well, where, did you, where are you getting the money for this? So at the top of that, th our total cost of what we're doing, what I just showed you there, is $11 million. Um, uh, billing income is $2 million. The cost savings for the health system is $29 million. So the net impact is $20 million to the positive. That's if, the, but that's $20 million to the positive to the insurer, mostly Medicare, right? Medicare gets to keep the money. Do you think that's good news to my senior leadership? Yep. Ooh, the, the uh, chief financial officer, who's a Texan, says, that's revenue destroying. Because where does the savings come from? It's, it's from stopping all the hospitalizations. And in a fee-for-service world, that's where we get the money. So we're very good at what we do. We are now moving to re, um, contracts where if we keep people out of the hospital, we get to keep the difference. Guess what his view is now? Charles, what else do you need? <laughs> and what about overhead? This is another thing that I see as I go around places. You know, you have all the clinicians are doing all the work. Well, so I'm, I'm part of the overhead, and I'm not a mainstream clinician. I go to lots of very meaningful meetings. There's a system director for palliative care, two system managers, one full-time finance person, a full-time quality measurement. So there are six people who are doing nothing but infrastructure for this. You've got to build in, you gotta build in the, if you're going to do it, you've got to build in the pieces to make it work. This is, I think, is fascinating, because one, um, one of the broad messages, it's all of those doctors. This would all be fine if you could just get those doctors on board. So in our system, as in many, Press Ganey does an annual survey which, with a goal of measuring physician alignment. It is probably the thing most on CEOs' minds. If I don't have the physicians with me, I'm going to fail as a healthcare system. This is to the question in the survey, overall, I am satisfied with hospice services. 3,600 physicians surveyed, 1,800 responded. And what I want you to see for this in this question here, if if a, a five is strongly agree, a four is agree, a three is neutral, and that the letters there are each of the individual hospitals, the message is clear. Not only is the, the esteem in which the hospice and palliative care is all linked together in their minds high, but it's getting higher every year. This is among the highest scores on the survey. So we cannot say the doctors are against us. They are actually want this, want this for their patients. But that, that brings us to that, well, if that's true and we're, we're uh, experiencing the, the patterns we are, and if the doctors are on our side, well, that's something else we have to change, our attitude about, well, where are the doctors in this? So let me show you an example. Um, and I said, since I'm a medical oncologist, I can talk like this. The, uh, oh, those oncologists, they just make money from chemotherapy. They don't tell the truth. They don't tell the prognosis. They're cold heartless and they don't care. They're anti-palliative care and they're anti-hospice. Not, not, not in California, of course. <laughs> so I went to the oncologists uh, in our, um, for our system and I gave them this data. This is the, the median length of stay of the patients they referred for hospice care by doctor. And I showed them the average for them is 21 days and the average nationally is 40 days. And I asked them what they thought it should be. And they said 90 days. Well, there's a gap. And that's, why we, and that's what quality improvement is for. There's a gap. You say we should be here, the standards are here, and your performance is here. I gave them this information that, so they could see their names compared to all the other oncologists. And it went up to 40 days after one year. So not only are they for it, but they're willing to say, oh, I guess I thought I was doing better. Because oncologists, all doctors, are systematically over-optimistic. 
but nobody ever gave them the feedback before. They all thought they were doing fine. There was no information to the contrary. Well, I was like a kid with a new toy. Ooh, look what I did with the oncologist. So I went to the other specialist. 15 days to 27 days, and that's 1,800 doctors. All right, nowhere, nobody ever talks about doctors sort of reforming and, and getting longer lengths of stay because they refer earlier on their own with just a piece of paper once a year. So to me, this, is, this strikes at the heart of some of the things our field has said about those doctors. They're on board, they get it, but they need our help. So conclusions, they value palliative care highly, they want long lengths of stay. More than 25% want palliative care to do it, to do it for them. All right, you can't teach somebody who doesn't want to learn how to do it, primary palliative care. And when they're given their data by their own specialty, they improve. This is about half the palliative care, care um, team at the large teaching hospital. And this is on the wall of the oncology unit. Now this is the one that I nearly fell over in a swoon. I never, I mean, it's one thing to talk the talk, it's another thing to put um, uh, letters into a marble wall. Because, oh my God, the patients will see it. It's right there in the lobby. This sort of, oh, it's just ordinary. It, of course it's part of what we do, and of course it's part of the oncology unit. And nobody gets in, in a tizzy about it. And actually, people are really proud of the, of the skills on this particular unit. And the people that feel badly are the orthopedics nurses at down on 5 Orange who can't pull it together. And so the patients move to this floor where the nurses, nursing staff knows how to do it. So what about outcomes? I want to bring you now to a, a case as we're getting close to finishing here. Marin was a, a young woman with stage three ovarian cancer, diagnosed in 2014, and she died two years later. Her husband, an emergency medicine physician, was her primary caregiver. She was interviewed in front of a new class of fellows, um, and I'm on one side of him, and Dr. Hudak, his, uh, uh, her palliative care um, hospice doctor when she was inpatient was there. Two boys, age three and five. She got standard best care at the NCI designated cancer center across the street. But when she developed inoperable, breast can uh, inoperable bowel obstruction and intractable nausea and vomiting, she just said, oh, I, I can't do this anymore, and came to Kobacker House with the expectation she would die. We used octreotide, standard treatment in, in uh, hospice and palliative care for 25 years, but appears to be unknown across the street. Um, and she had a miraculous resurrection uh, for three months. And then she died uh, just after Christmas uh, with three days of being ill, really. Um, how do you feel your role as a physician influenced this whole experience, um, you know, for both Marin and your family? You know, we're a ER doctor, so we like instant credit. I know there's a couple of other ER doctors in the room. We like instant gratification. We were talking before. I, I cut my own lawn because it's long, and I'll probably do it when I leave here, and then, and then it's short, so it's instant gratification. <laughs> it's great. I mean, I'm never, I'm, everyone's like, you should just outsource it. You're so busy. I'm like, no. I mean, it's like, it's a very small lot. So, you know, it takes an hour. So it's just fun, and it's just gratifying. And like, in the ER, we like to fix things, you know? If the lung is down, we put a tube in, and then the lung is up, you know what I mean? If their blood pressure is low, we give them a couple bags of fluid, and if that doesn't work, we give them some pressors, and we fix it. And it's amazing. And I was very, you know, I work at Riverside and Grant, and they're very busy, as I'm sure the majority of you guys, probably you guys in it, you know, I mean, so don't have time to sit down with patients for a really long time like you did with Marin. So, and the team that saw Marin at the James, she was inpatient all the time for various complications, bowel obstruction, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they have one foot out the door, you know, you see the intern at 5 a.m., Maybe you were up because they were drawing her blood at the same time, but you barely remember it. And then the team comes in, and they're, they're, they're out so quick. And then you have a question, so then the intern or the, the mid-level resident comes back. I don't know. i got to ask my senior. Who, senior comes back. I don't know. i got to ask my fellow. Fellow comes back, says, well, it's July. I don't know. I gotta, I'm a brand-new fellow. i got to ask the attending. <laughs> so you, you started attempting to get an answer of, you know, are we going to go home? Are we going to switch from heparin to Lovenox to something else? Well, you got the answer, I don't know, 12 or 24 hours later. And that's not what I like, and that's not what an ER doctor is, you know? So it has taught me 
to slow down in the ER, to sit down with a patient, to reevaluate the patient more frequently, to come back and say, hey, you know, Mr. Jones, the chest x-ray looked great. Pa patients want to hear results really quickly, and I never realized that. I would go in at the beginning, say, right, we're going to do a big workup, we're going to get a lot of CAT scans, we're going to give you some pain meds, and I'll come back when the workup's over, and you'll probably go home. And now I go back into the room as much as I can, and the patients love it. And after Marin died, I find myself, with f exceptions that you can count on one hand, I've never cried with a patient. I, I've cried in, with some pediatric resuscitations that unfortunately don't go well, because but even before I was a parent. But it's, we're numb, right? I mean, I don't know. I, I, work, I worked Friday, and guy coded and died. And that's what we do. It's terrible. It's terrible. And I walked on into the next room, and it, it's almost as if it didn't had, didn't, hadn't happened. And now I'm getting out later. I'm spending more time with patients. Um, I'm reassuring patients more. I'm sitting down with patients. I d Prescanies. You guys know about Prescanies? My comments were, great doctor, really nice, really funny, loud, fast talker, and seemed like he was in a rush. And now they're not, those aren't my comments anymore. So it was, um, and I, it's because of you. You sat down with Barrett and we said, don't you have to go see another patient? He said, no, I'm in no rush. And I never understood that. I was not able to not know rushing, because that's what we do. And I wish some of my partners would learn a little bit from this, too. You can't sit for an hour in a patient's room at Riverside. You just can't, because you have 29 patients to see before your shift's over. You just can't. But it's nice to just sit down for a minute or two and spend time with family. So it's made me um, a much better physician, a much better human, a much better dad, not rushed much better friend and son. Great question. And I think this captures the effect of the work that we do when it goes sort of outside our areas. Um, in this case, his education was through the care of his wife. Um, for many, it's because they have required rotations. Um, they see it, they see it's important, and although they may not go into our field, it changes them as ED docs or uh, OBs or primary care, whoever, whoever they go. It's, it's very exciting. So, to finish, we started with Frank. Frank got the best cancer care. Um, he started losing weight, he started losing um, uh, vigor. You notice he's now in a wheelchair. You can see the weight loss in his face. He's there with his EMT daughter. And he was enrolled in hospice care. It was expected. And he was enrolled in hospice care for three months. And he began um, active dying. And I told the family I thought he had 24 to 48 hours left to live because he had lapsed into a coma. I was on at my desk, 7.30 in the morning, and I got a telephone call. Well, uh, before that. I got word that he was restless and moaning, and he seemed to be in pain. Dexamethasone had been an important part of his pain regimen, and he wasn't able to swallow anymore. I said, well, that's easy. Just poke it up his bum. It's very well absorbed from rectal mucosa if it's moist. So that happened, I think, on Sunday. So on Tuesday, when I got this call, I picked up the phone. It was Frank. <laughs> I want to go to Pennsylvania. Fortunately, I was old enough and wise enough to say, ah, tell me more. <laughs> his grandson was getting, or his son was getting married. And this, this had been planned. There was no way for them to see him where he was living before he died and go with the wedding as scheduled because this was part of an elaborately um, scheduled series of events. And they had just had his first grandchild. And he wanted to see his grandchild. So this is not a family that's wealthy. They cannot do air ambulance. There is no way that he can drive. He must go by commercial airline. How many of you in the room think he should go? Looks unanimous. So what are the rules? What are the FAA rules about someone who his doctor said he was 24 to 48 hours from dying, and that was three days ago? 
Well, it was the social worker on the team who got the information, and the, and the rules are this. If someone dies en route on any commercial plane, the airplane must land at the nearest airport. All right, so all of you who are so enthusiastic, what if you were on the plane and you thought you were going to um, Philadelphia and instead you ended up in Kansas City? So I was, the social work was just terrific because it was like, okay, you know, we can get oxygen there, it's not a problem, you know, here is meds, but these are the rules, and you don't want to, if, if he, he may very well die trying, and if that's okay with you, we're, we're behind you, but we have to prepare for if he dies trying to do this. So the, the social worker said, so, if he dies, just tuck the blanket up under his chin, and if anybody asks, say he's sleeping. So practical. <laughs> so he did get there. This is rural Pennsylvania. They got married in their home. If you were there, you were on the lawn out here. They were on their back deck getting married. And there's Frank and his wife and his new daughter-in-law and his son. Now is that an outcome of health care? I think we need to say affirmatively, absolutely. This model of taking care of people as whole people, it took a lot of medical effort to get this to happen. But this is the completion of the care that started when he had his spots on his lung, and the focus was going to be, we're going to treat the cancer and work on your quality of life, and it will be well done across this trajectory. Now, not everyone wants a dying man at their wedding, but this family did. He died the day after. So for all of our patients, for everything you're doing in the coalition, thank you for your hard work. This new era we're moving into, uh, we are part of it. We are going to be, in, in my view, probably one of the most important parts. But that means we got to be ready. It's a new age. It's a new era for us to be moving into this. Thanks very much.